So good evening, everybody. You're very, very welcome to our third uh, Zoom meeting since the COVID lockdown. And as you know, next year, 2021, in Greece, they will be celebrating 200 years since the start of their revolution, 1821. But 1821 for the Greeks was a bit like our 1916. It was the start of the process. Whereas here in Ireland, we're uh, coming towards the end of our, well, we're, we're, we're near, nearing the end of our uh, decade of commemorations. And it's, it's, um, there are some similarities between what was going on in Ireland um, 100 years ago and what's happening at the moment. It's a time at the moment, as you know, of, of, of amazing confusion between COVID and Brexit and a, a strange British Prime Minister called Boris. A hundred years ago, they had their own strange British Prime Minister called Lloyd George. They had just emerged from a terrible Spanish flu with millions and millions of casualties, more so than in the World War itself. And of course, um, Ireland was, was uh, emerging from uh, its own war of independence. We're very, very lucky to have somebody, Michael Barry, who is a, a multiple author of many, many books, but his most, his most uh, recent four books have been on the Irish Revolution. Three full volumes, one on 1916, one on the War of Independence, one on the Civil War, and now this amazing volume called The Irish Revolution, which is uh, actually very hard to, hand, to, to, to um, hold up with one hand because it's so heavy, and it's a mass of photographs. There's 850 photographs with captions in this book. So it's a, it's a superb resource and a, a masterpiece of detail. Michael's background as a railway engineer shows us that he's a master of project management. Nobody else but him could consider starting a, such a project. So I'm delighted to hand over to Michael Barry, please. Yeah, very good. So anyway, delighted to be talking to my friends in the uh, Hellenic Society. However, this time it's through the, as we're finding out, through the slightly untried electronic means. But uh, I hope it will go well uh, this evening. So uh, as Paddy mentioned, uh, this autumn uh, I published this book on the Irish Revolution, and it covers the years 1916 to 1923. And this constitutes the elemental founding stage of the Irish state. And this evening, I'm going to deal with each of the periods. That's 1916, the War of Independence, the Truce, and then the Civil War. It's a huge topic. There are a whole host of separate, separate events in, in many ways. So I'll have intend to proceed con allegro and uh, to get, try and give you the essence all within a reasonable time. <clears throat> so one might say that the need for an Irish revolution began back in the midst of time when the Normans landed in Wexford. So fast forward to the 19th century and there were several uprisings in Ireland, all which were quickly suppressed. And at the start of the 20th century, the, there was a change. There was a, a strengthening of Irish national co consciousness, both political and cultural. And as a third Home Rule Bill was introduced in 1912, the Union's population uh, could not accept this. And the Ulster Volunteer Force was formed to prevent the uh, to prevent home rule uh, in reaction in Dublin the Irish volunteers were established and in April 1914 the gun you could say reappeared back in the island of Ireland when the UVF imported 25,000 rifles and the Irish volunteers in response uh, imported 1500 old Mauser rifles the following August in Hoth and Kilcool. And as World War, the First World War broke out, John Redmond offered the services of the Irish Volunteers. Or there was a split, and the minority now under the effective control of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, who were heirs to the Fenians, planned for a rising using the maxim, England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. And as the activists prepared, the Germans 
uh, in contesting the war against Britain, were contacted and requested to send help. And move now to Kerry, or off the coast of Kerry. On the 20th of April in 1916, an arms shipment from Germany failed and the arms vessel was intercepted by the Royal Navy. And at the same time, Roger Casement was arrested in Kerry after landing from a German submarine. And this is quite an interesting colorized photograph showing Casement without his beard, he still has a moustache, amongst the German officers and two other volunteer companions with him. So as news filtered through of these events, these failures, Owen McNeil, the chief of staff of the Irish volunteers, countermanded the orders for an uprising, uh, the plans for which had been prepared unbeknownst to him. Uh, uh, the, and the, these, plan, ha, these plans uh, were for an uprising on Easter Sunday. But on Easter Sunday itself, the IRB military council met and they decided to proceed with the rising the following day. And so <coughs> on Easter Monday, on the 24th of April, mixed force of Irish citizens army and Irish volunteers assembled in fr front of Liberty Hall. And just before noon, the main formation headed for the GPO while other detachments set up in different locations all across uh, the, the core of Dublin, you could say. Uh, this is uh, a photograph of the GPO, uh, perhaps a little before that time. And a republic was proclaimed. The proclamation was clear and inspirational. God is invoked set out the central role of the Irish uh, Republican Brotherhood and overall optimistically, as it turned out, it refers to the support of the gallant allies in Europe, that's the Germans. Uh, the proclamation is thought to be mainly written by Patrick Pierce, but James Connolly's hand can be seen in the assertion of the right of the Irish people to the ownership of Ireland. Pierce read it out at the, in front of the GPO to uh, a few bemused onlookers. And after that, uh, Connolly turned to him and shook his hand and said, thanks be to God, Pierce, that we have lived to see this day. So volunteer battalions, as well as the Irish Citizens Army took over strategic locations at points all over Dublin. Uh, these and th this is a map published by the Irish Times just after the rebellion. Um, you, you may or may not be able to see it, but the, the various positions included the City Hall and Stephen's Green. North of the Liffey, there were uh, locations at uh, Church Street and at the Four Courts. And uh, south of the Liffey, uh, to the west, there was the South Dublin Union. The Jacobs B B Biscuit Factory, and not to forget uh, De Valera at Boland's Bakery. The British military soon reacted. Troops were rushed to Dublin Castle, and reinforcements were ordered from uh, garrisons and barracks all over the rest of Ireland to the city. And at the GPO, after an early skirmish on the Monday with Lancers Cavalry, the first days were mostly quiet. The fight became intense in other locations, though. City Hall was taken by troops who charged from Dublin Castle in, on Tuesday. And by Tuesday evening, the British had set up inner and outer cordons around the city. And Trinity College uh, Central Point was transformed into a staging post for the British military. And you see them, char you see them assembled here in Front Square in Trinity. And I mentioned uh, Stephen's Green. On Tuesday, British soldiers ensconced in the Shelburne Hotel using a machine gun cleared the, the, the green of the citizens' army who then retreated to the College of Surgeons. Uh, snipers on the roof engaged with the British who responded with machine gun fire. And this went on for several days. This is the contemporary view from the roof of the uh, the College of Surgeons and uh, 
I've already discussed with Paddy in advance for are these statues of uh, medical saints or not, but we can go into that another time. <laughs> uh, the following day on Wednesday morning, the fishery protection vessel Helga sailed up the Liffey and anchored by the Loop Line Bridge in front of the Custom House and it peppered the Liberty Hall, which was by then empty with its 12 pounder shells. Peppered is the word, you see it here. Uh, the, the building was damaged, but it didn't go on fire and wasn't destroyed. British troops continued to flood the city. By then, they had come to around 10,000 soldiers. And against these were a mere 1,400 of the Republican forces, much less, of course, because of the confusion caused by the, the, order, the contramandy order. Heavy fighting flared up in some volunteer garrisons, while the GPO headquarters and near, nearby outposts were being continuously raked with rifle and machine gun fire. And British 18-pounders, which had around Sackville St Street, were shelled, uh, and parts of Sackville Street were in flames by the, that evening. Uh, just to say... The only, the only shells the British had at that time were shrapnel shells, high um, uh, shells which caused, uh, which were designed to cause fire, hadn't been invented at that stage. They didn't even have high explosive shells. So the, these shrapnel shells were like cannonballs, but when they landed, they would have kinetic energy and they would set, uh, they weren't intended for that, but they did set alight things like newsprint on uh, in a barricade on Abbey Street and uh, Sackville Street was like a tinderbox and it went up presumably a bit like you see there but just to add that all the destruction was caused by fire not they weren't pounded down by artillery shells so Sackville Street was on flame as you see and Outputs on the street became untenable and the volunteers withdrew to the GPO. And this is the famous engraving by Paget, which shows the scene in the GPO. It's very dramatic. Uh, obviously, it's um, uh, there's a bit of um, hyper-realism here, but it shows the main events. It shows Pierce... Uh, standing by the stretcher, Connolly on the stretcher. Connolly was wounded in his shin by, um, I think it was uh, rico ricochets from an, uh, a shrapnel shell just outside the GPO. And uh, by Friday, by midday on Friday, the the British had pushed for, forward the the um, <clears throat> the eighteen pounders sufficient to. Uh, start pounding the GPO and by evening uh, it had been gone on fire and the roof was collapsing and they decided to abandon the building. And they, they retreated from the GPO and they took over a, a terrace in nearby Mount Moor Street. And the, the British were barricaded at the at the Parnell Street end of Moore Street, and uh, civilian, as well as the O'Reilly who made a charge up Moore Street, civilians were being killed. And moved by the sight of civilian deaths, Pierce proposed to end the rising, and they all agreed uh, that they would have to treat with the British. So unconditional surrender was agreed on the Sunday afternoon of Easter week when Patrick Pierce, accompanied by Nurse O'Farrell, uh, and they met General Lowe. Now, this is a photograph of the uh, photographs in the Daily Sketch after the event. It shows various, uh, various events there. The rebels were rounded up and sent to Richmond Prison. Uh, so you can see the top left photograph and the bottom bottom right, um, Sean McBride on the bottom left, on the top left, and uh, the two brothers uh, of um, Joseph Plunkett uh, 
on the bottom right and on, on the the left bottom left uh, there's Countess Markovic being being escorted uh, off after a court martial but what, what's particularly interesting is the photograph the famous photograph dare I say iconic photograph of the rising of uh, Patrick Pierce uh, surrendering to General Lowe, the British commander. And if you look at Pierce's feet, there's, it appears he's on his own. And this is the famous photograph, which was airbrushed. They didn't use airbrushes then, they used little watercolor brushes. But this is where Elizabeth O'Farrell, who was on the far side, away from the camera, uh, of Pierce, where she has disappeared from this uh, uh, photograph. Uh, it has been alleged by some that this was a dark plot by the British to air, airbrush the part that the brave women, there were brave women, played in, uh, in their role against the British Empire during the 1916 rebellion. But every other photograph I've seen, originals of this photograph, uh, her legs are in it. So my take on this is that this was a, a busy sub-editor who wanted to tidy up that photograph and just got out the, the watercolour brush and painted her out. He also did, as you can see, some crude touch-up of the face of the two British officers there. So, as I said, most of the volunteers were escorted to captivity in Richmond barracks. And in the days and weeks that followed, the bulk of the prisoners, those not selected for trial, were sent for internment in Britain. And as the Republican outposts surrendered, the citizens of Dublin to stock of their shattered city centre. There was devastation all around in one of the principal cities of the supposedly United Kingdom and the GPO and other buildings in and around Sackville Street were burnt out. Uh, as you can see. But as I said, this was not shell damage, this was fire damage. And so retribution was, was swift and brutal. Field general courts marshals were rapidly sent, set up. The trials were rushed and lacked any semblance of justice. Leaders of the rising, including some less prominent ones, were sentenced to death. The condemned men were brought to Kilmainham jail for execution. And these are most of them, except Sean McDermott and, and James Connolly. Uh, the executions were carried out in the grim stonebreaker's yard there with military precision. And all the executed met their deaths bravely. And J James Connolly, as I mentioned, uh, had been wounded and had been kept in a hospital in, or a field hospital, I suppose you call it, in Dublin Castle. And his execution was particularly ghastly. On the 12th of May, 1916, he was conveyed by ambulance to Kilmainham. And as dawn broke, he was placed on the kitchen chair and shot. I like this poster. It's for a relief fund in New York. Uh, but it, it show, show, depicts the execution in a very colourful and graphic way as if he was out in the countryside. But the net result is still the same, I'm afraid. And so the Easter Rising was suppressed and it appeared that the British could return to concentrate on winning the Great War. However, the execution of the rebel leaders led to a rise in sympathy for the cause of independence. Uh, immediately after the rising, over 2,500 Republicans had been rounded up all over the country and shipped to various prisons and internment camps in Britain. They began to be released from detention by at the very end of 1916 and into early 1917. As they arrived back in Ireland, most of them joined Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin, which never had any act or part in the rising, but it became repurposed and um, refreshed and a wave of there was a wave of by-elections in Ireland in 1917, mainly because the Irish independent, uh, Irish uh, IPP MPs, most of them were elderly and they began to, to die. So there were a lot of 
by-elections and Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin won them. And uh, uh, this photograph here is in 1917, one of the by-elections that showed William Cosgrave making a speech from the balcony of Kilkenny Courthouse after just being elected in the by-election there. And you see on his right his fellow MP, Eamon de Valera, and he had just won the by-election in Clare. And as the World War ended, uh, the general British general election had been deferred. And so in December 1918, they held a general election and Sinn Féin gained a commanding 73 seats. They resoundedly eclipsed the Irish Parliamentary Party, which only got six seats. The Union has got 26 seats. And the Sinn Féin uh, MPs decided to establish uh, a parliament in Ireland, and this was the first doll. And this is a poster commemorating the first doll. Uh, I think the sitting that you see, you'll see, all the members are there, but uh, that, that sitting was later on because the first doll itself, actually, I think there were only 20 something of the order, 25, 30 attendees, because most of the MPs were in prison at the time. Um, so the first all when it met in January 1919, it it ratified the Irish Republic that had been declared in in Easter 1916. It also sought recognition of Ireland at the Paris Peace Conference, which was just commencing then. But in the event, the delegation there, sent there was shunned. Uh, the victorious allies did not want to discommode their fellow ally, Britain, with these people who, who it could be argued had dallied with the Germans. But very importantly, on the same day as the first doll was held, there was an ambush by volunteers at Solohead Beg in County Tipperary, which resulted in two RIC deaths. And although unauthorized, the ambush marked the start of a ruthless phase of the War of Independence. This is a poster. Uh, set up afterwards uh, with a reward for Dan, Dan Breen, one of the leaders of that ambush. Uh, events move on, uh, moved on. Uh, Michael Collins established the squad in Dublin, a group of ruthless young men whose mission was to eliminate spies who had been scour the scourge of all previous Irish independence movements. The DMP G division of detectives who had been clever gatherers of intelligence on Republicans were neutered. And across the country, the effectiveness of the RIC, again, uh, the front line of the British grasp on Ireland was diminished as they were boycotted and then their barracks began to be assaulted. And at the end of 1919, the RSC were withdrawn from the smaller, isolated and vulnerable barracks to, to bigger barracks in the towns, which were fortified and became mini forts. So for the British cabinet, the, the, the news from Ireland just continued to be bad. And they decided to make new initiatives, including reinforcement of police. Uh, there was one headache still, in place uh, just after the, the war, it was the Home Rule Bill. Something had to be done to change it. And a Government of Ireland bill was introduced in December 1919. This was different from the Home Rule Bill, which is an All-Ireland uh, piece of legislation. The new Government of Ireland bill was partitionist, proposed in Ireland, divided into Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. In the spring of 1920, Lloyd George decided to put in place a new team, team in Dublin Castle. Uh, important among these was General Sir Neville MacReady. You see him on the left. He was appointed Commander in Chief of the Army in Ireland. And on the right, Sir Hamer Greenwood, a Canadian, but uh, an MP in Britain. He was appointed Chief Secretary again in April 1920. Not all were impressed by Greenwood, uh, 
Lord Ornmore notes in his in his journal, a Canadian bagman and a windbag at that, and he was he was very good at dissimulating in the House of Commons when there when any news of the atrocities committed in Ireland uh, came up. The auxiliaries loved him. So as the IRA assaulted the RIC, a wave of new recruits, mostly ex-servicemen, uh, arrived in Ireland and they were known as the Black and Tans. They served within the ranks of the RIC and they were dispersed across the country. And a separate parliamentary force of ex-officers known as the Auxiliary Division, nominally under the RIC, but they operated separately. The, this was also established and this, these were assigned to the hottest areas across the country and their brutal approach generated fear and incurred the hatred of the local population. And here we see two Crosley tender loads of the auxiliaries posing in front of Amiens Street Station. And as incidentally, this is one of the 130 photographs that are especially commissioned to be colorized in the book, uh, as Paddy mentioned. Uh, th these were colorized by the master in that field, uh, John O'Byrne, and these helped bring the events of the Irish Revolution to life. And we'll be seeing a few of these as we proceed. So as disorder continued in Ireland, uh, the uh, Crown forces hit back and March 1920 saw the Lord Mayor of Cork, Thomas McCurtain, assassinated by mass men. The IRA changed tactics by mid-1920 and they switched from attacking the RIC barracks to ambushing mobile patrols, whether it was of military or auxiliaries or joint patrols. And thus over time, they empirically developed an effective form of guerrilla warfare. And in return, there were many reprisals by the ground forces in towns and villages across Ireland uh, over the course of 1920. And one of the most spectacular occurred in the 20th of September in Balbriggan. It, it, it was spectacular, but it also became very well known because it was uh, very close to Dublin and thus easy for uh, journalists to, to go and visit. And they did publicise Bal Balbriggan. Following the shooting of two RSC officers in the town, auxiliaries laid waste to it and local businesses and scores of houses were destroyed. Uh, they captured two volunteers, brought to the barracks, bayoneted them and dumped their bodies. And the, the, the uh, continental press had a lot of periodicals uh, which were coloured and done in kind of boys on scale. And this is La Tribuna Illustrata of Rome, which depicts El Terrora in Irlanda. It shows women packing their belongings, fleeing from burnt out houses in Balbriggan. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, uh, these, these uh, colored periodicals I find very evocative, if not totally accurate in some of their depictions of Ireland. Now, a young volunteer was captured during a raid on a British ration party in Church Street in Dublin in September, 1920. This young man, Kevin Barry, was court-martialed, sentenced and sentenced to be hanged. Because of his age, there was huge agitation uh, for clemency. However, he was executed on the 1st of November, 1920 in Montjoy, amid mass protests. And this is a photograph that I took of the Montjoy prison death book, as they call it. And you can see here quite clearly how Kevin Barry uh, aged 18, and uh, he was uh, executed at 8 a.m. on the 1st of November there. They, I find this quite quite uh, moving, this, this death book. And in Cork, the Lord Mayor there, Terence McSweeney, had gone on hunger strike after being arrested in August 1920. And 74 days later, he died because of the hunger strike and his death sparked a worldwide wave of sympathy. 
his remains were laid in in state in Southwark Cathedral, and he was la later buried in Cork amid, amid huge crowds. And again, here's another Continental magazine, Le Petit Journal, depicting depicting Le Martyr Irlandais. There was indeed uh, widespread support and sympathy all across the world, and it so happened that a, a young Vietnamese then working in Paris, one Ho Chi Minh commented, a nation which it has such citizens will never surrender. The British engaged in outrageous falsehoods during the War of Independence. Uh, they had big press offices uh, in uh, two in Dublin Castle, one in uh, the Irish office in London and a separate one in the Army GHQ in Par Parkade Street. Um, and I'm going to give you one example now. And by the way, next autumn, I hope to publish a book, another one, on this time on fake news in the War of Independence. So on the 12th of November 1920, there was a relatively minor engagement between the auxiliaries and the IRA at Ballymacallicut Creamery, which is just outside Tralee town. And this was presented in press reports as resounding victory for the Crown forces in an attempt to show how they are winning. And to re reinforce this message, photographs appeared in the press showing <clears throat> auxiliaries running up men in civilian dress with bodies lying around as part of what is described as the Battle of Tralee. And this on the left is what appeared in the Illustrated London News on the 27th of November. And uh, it shows the, the, the auxiliaries successful capturing the, the Irish rebels there. But if you look to the right there, that's a photograph, a contemporary photograph of Vico Road in Killiney. That's not, that's not Tralee. And a couple of days after the, these photographs were published, the Irish Independent uh, exposed all this. So uh, the, it was a staged setup that had been taken at Vico Road and it had, the, the, there were two captains in the information section, Dublin Castle were behind it. And, embarrassing questions were asked in the House of Lords. Again, it diminished their credibility. It rebounded on them. Still, in November 1920, um, uh, one of the most, uh, the biggest events of the War of Independence occurred. On the 21st of November, the IRA assassinated British spies uh, in the event that became known as Bloody Sunday. 30 people died that day, with several others dying later of their wounds. It started in the morning when the IRA uh, <clears throat> set out to kill suspected British spies against, uh, across central Dublin. And this is a dramatic depiction, again, by the Illustrated London News. Later that day, Crown forces fired at the crowd at a football match at Croke Park. And that night, Three men in custody in Dublin Castle were, were shot. They were shot dead using the hoary old excuse of uh, while trying to escape. Uh, November continued to be bloody. It ended with an ambush in Kilmichael in County Cork. On the 28th of November, 18 auxiliaries set out in two crossly tenders from McCroom for Dunmanway. Commandant Tom Barry and 40 men of the 3rd West Cork Brigade filing column awaited them, and he had set up positions on both sides of the road. By the end of the action, the auxiliaries had been wiped out. This is a, a memorial or a marker on the site, and it, it unambiguously states that 17 terrorist officers of the British forces died here. I, I would say that Tom Barry had a hand in writing that inscription. So this was a, a, another blow to the British. And it hither, hitherto that they, they ha, were pr proposing the idea that the Irish were just a bunch of gunmen. But this now was a, a manifestation that a guerrilla army, 
little resources could defeat an elite force. <clears throat> but retribution was to come. In, uh, Dece in early December, uh, Cork City Centre was burned by the auxiliaries and it caused widespread damage. The centre was devastated and stores on Patrick Street and premises on the side streets were wrecked. Uh, hundreds of residences were destroyed. The City Hall and the Carnegie Library were in ruins and the damage is calculated to be around 160 million euro in today's values. The British desperately tried to obscure who had burnt the city. And um, here's another color photograph, which I like. It shows the Dublin City Fire Brigade, which came down to assist their Cork counterparts. And uh, it showed them by, I think that's Patrick's, Patrick Street Bridge there. And um, the Fire Brigade officer, I believe, Standing in front, proudly standing in front of the machine is Captain Jack Myers, who's grandfather of a certain journalist who, Kevin Myers. And as 1920 ended, the war reached a new intensity. And, and as I mentioned, there had been many unofficial reprisals across Ireland in that year, but in January 1921, uh, they decided to make them official. And at Middleton, the first official reprisal uh, occurred, uh, allowed for under martial law, which had been just declared in Munster. And there were official uh, reprisals all across the province. And as the British increased their, their forces and roamed the country, um, IRA ambushes and raids escalate, and both sides improved their tactics. These included the IRA gaining mastery of road mines, which were able to blow up Crosley tenders and armoured cars. This is a shot from Capel Street, which shows a tank of World War I vintage, uh, incongruously imposing order in Dublin. Uh, the tank was a, it probably was propaganda really to try and scare the populace. The British Army de developed cross country sweeps uh, to try and cro crossing across the country to round up the IRA or the flying columns. Uh, the, IR the RAF participated, but only really to carry mail or, or, or um, passengers. And it took till late March 1921 before they were permitted by a squeamish British cabinet to use machine guns and drop, drop bombs. Another Italian magazine, which shows the, the stirring engagement there, but it, it says that the airmen had foiled an ambush, killing five assailants. Totally wrong. In, in reality, the RAF after March 21 only made a few ineffectual forays and they never they never touch, touched the the IRA really the the RAF really had no uh, had no real role effective role for, for the British in the the war of independence but there was great brutality by the crown forces in particular the auxiliary force for example D company of the auxiliaries in Galway built up a reputation for great cruelty. On the 1st of November, 1920, as they drove by, they shot dead a young woman sitting down in Gort. Two weeks later, they abducted a father, uh, Griffin, who had Republican sympathies, and his body was found later dumped near Barnum. On the 26th of November, they made a sweep through South Galway. They swept in and captured two volunteers, the Loch Nan brothers, and arrested them and they were dragged by ropes back on the back of one of the Crosley tenders and brought back to their base. And on the 5th of December, their charred and mutilated bodies were found in a pond. And this is probably the most gruesome photograph of the War of Independence. Here are the remains of the unfortunate Loch Nan brothers. Back to Dublin as 
IRA Director of Intelligence, Michael Collins, had established a GHQ intelligence staff at Crow Street. At an early stage, he cultivated a string of informers who uh, were very valuable, and he established systems of safe houses, pubs, and hotels across the city where he and his shadowy operatives functioned. And moving into 1921, on the 25th of May, there was what could be called a spectacular. Uh, volunteers of the Dublin Brigade attacked the Custom House. The bu building was set on fire. This was the biggest IRA operation of the war. It resulted in the death of five volunteers. Four civilians were also dead. And over 100 experienced volunteers were also captured. And this was a blow. However, this must be seen against the Dublin Brigade's nominal strength of 4,500 men. I'd previously mentioned the Government of Ireland Bill. This was enacted at the end of 1920 in, in the House of Commons. And it established the partition of, of Ireland and proposed northern and southern parliaments. There was an election for these in May and Sinn Féin unopposed won practically all the seats in the south. The Unionists won a majority in the north and King George V opened the northern parliament in Belfast in June 1921. Unionists show, showed up, the, the um, nationalist uh, Sinn Féin and the IPP MPs are member of that parliament did not show up. Reflecting a mood for conciliation, the king made a carefully nuanced speech which asked for all Irishmen to pause, to forgive and forget. It, it was a harbinger of peace initiatives. Previously, the British government had vacillated between peace and war, but eventually plumbed for negotiation. It invited Eamon de Valera to meet Lloyd George in London and General McCready, uh, Commander-in-Chief in Ireland, met de Valera at the Mansion House in, in Dublin. There's a photograph of McCready being greeted by the Dublin Lord Mayor going into the meeting and you can see in his pocket his revol bulging revolver just in case uh, anything happened. A truce was agreed, which came into force on the 11th of July, 1921. Under its terms, the British seized military manoeuvres, raids and searches. In turn, the IRA were to cease attacks on the Crown forces. And as a piece of sort uh, uh, came about, the IRA set up liaison officers across the country who interacted with their British military counterparts. Uh, the IRA GHQ initiated major training and redoubled its efforts to procure arms. Crown forces mainly stayed in their barracks, but still kept an eye on, on, on the Republicans during the truce period. Immediately after the truce came into effect, de Valera went to London to meet Lloyd George. This is the Illustrated London News depicting the meeting. Lloyd George, after a bit of sparring, Lloyd George presented a formal offer. Perhaps the tension was such as between Boris Johnson and Ursa van der Leyen this evening, who knows. But anyway, um, Lloyd George presented de Valera with a kind of take it or leave it offer. And as it turned out, what he offered them then was practically the same as was offered later on to the plenipotentiaries. And it gave the 26 counties dominion status with partition and hence the continuation of Northern Ireland, which remained in place. Uh, there was control over home defense, taxation, finance and policing. De Valera was displeased but brought it back to the cabinet in Dublin and they, they didn't like it and many were the, the one of the prime things was the abandonment of the republic which had been declared in 1916. Nevertheless negotiations continued and plen plenipotentiaries were sent to London in October to, to negotiate and the odds were stacked against them. They had very unclear terms of reference, but in the face of 
Lloyd George's histrionics, which offered only signing a treaty or facing renewed war. The delegation did not consult with Dublin, but signed the treaty document on London on the 6th of uh, December 1921. The treaty they signed set out in 18 paragraphs how the Irish Free State would be formed as a dominion within the British Empire. One important thing within it was that the members of the free, new Free State Parliament had to, as well as swear, swearing allegiance to the constitution of the Irish Free State, they had also to swear to be faithful to the king. And this was a step for, too far. On the north, the, the, there was a SOP that a boundary commission was to be set up. So back in Dublin, there was immediate disagreement about the terms of the treaty. And the, this was led in cabinet by Eamon de Valera. And the treaty the debates and the doll that followed were, were bitter affairs. And now disagreement reigns. And this is the concluding event of the Irish Revolution. So in the Dáil debates, uh, those in favour took the pragmatic view that while it wasn't perfect, it gave a form of independence. And those on the other side, uh, it meant giving up the Republic declared in 1916 for a lesser form of independence. And a vote was held on 7th of January 1922. The treaty was narrowly ratified by 60, 64 votes to 57. And so uh, the, the wheels moved on and on 16th of January, Michael Collins is shown here, arriving by taxi in Dublin Castle to take it over. And he and other members of the new government were received by the last Viceroy of Ireland, Lord Fitzalan. Under the treaty provisions, a provisional government had been established and a new army was formed. However, the IRA, the traditional IRA, was mainly anti-treaty. And as under the, the provisions, the British army began to gradually withdraw from barracks, there was friction between both sides. Uh, this is a wonderful colorized photograph here of Richard Mulcahy, who's chief of staff of the new pro-treaty army. Outnumbered by the anti-treaty IRA at the beginning of 1922, the new army rapidly recruited and grew in size. Um, by July 1922, an establishment of 35,000 was authorized. And at its peak, in mid-1923, this army had grown to around 55,000 men. This shows the flag being raised by Sean McKeown of the Provisional Government Army at the Great barracks at that loan. Dissatisfaction rumbled on and the anti-treaty IRA met to form an executive which rejected the authority of the new government. And in April 1922, the, the anti-treaty IRA took over the four courts and other prominent buildings in Dublin. And in separate from this, in the spring of 1922, there were po many pogroms in Northern Ireland, particularly in Belfast, and thousands of refugees flowed, flowed south trying to escape these. The anti-treaty IRA took over institutions in Dublin that they regarded as synony synonymous with loyalism. And I show you, uh, to me, a very poignant photograph. It shows a young refugee, one Bridie Gallagher, Plus, clutching our doll, standing outside one of these buildings, the Kildare Street Club. Again, wonderfully colorized. So uh, tension ramped up very much when on 22nd of June, 1922, Sir Henry Wilson was assassinated in London by the London IRA. Again, a dramatic depiction by the Le Petit Journal. This caused huge panic in the British cabinet. They initially uh, planned to attack, send uh, destroyers to Dublin, get the British troops who were still in the barracks in Dublin out to attack the forecourts, but they were calmed down. Lord George wrote to Michael Collins 
and stated that the IRA, i.e. the anti-treaty IRA, were to blame, and he assisted that the continuing forecourt's occupation, as well as the ambiguous status of the IRA, could no longer be tolerated. And then a few days later, on the night of the 26th of June, Lieutenant General J.J. O'Connell, who was Deputy Chief of Staff of the pro-treaty army, was kidnapped and brought in captivity to the basement in the four courts. And this was the last straw and the provisional government decided to attack the four courts. And they, they borrowed a couple of 18 pounders from the British and uh, uh, some soldiers were uh, rapidly trained on how to do it. And at 4 a.m. on the 28th of June, 1922, bombardment of the four courts commenced. Uh, the 18 pounders uh, were placed south of the Liffey initially, but they were stationed all around the four courts complex eventually. Um, they continued uh, their bombardment and they opened two breaches and uh, the breaches were stormed on the afternoon of the 29th of, of June. And confusion reigned within the four courts a huge, if any of you have been within it, it is a huge complex, many buildings. And around midday of 30th of June, there were fires in what had been called the headquarters block. It's at the back of the four courts opposite the bridewell. Um, the fire caused explosives stored at one end to explode. And there was a massive explosion and it caused uh, huge damage, but it set the nearby public record office on fire and sent its contents into aerial oblivion, which you see in this dramatic uh, photograph, and priceless documents wafted over Dublin. As the siege of the Four Courts was entering its end game to in effect, relieve the pressure on the occupants of the four courts. Uh, the anti-treaty IRA took over buildings in central Dublin along Sackville Street, including the so-called block. This is a, a map showing it. A lot of hotels in it. You can see the Gresham Hotel, Granville, and Hammam Hotels on Upper Sackville Street. And by the 2nd of July, the pro-treaty forces had the block surrounded and they blasted away with artillery and machine gun fire. And by the 5th of July, the block was in ruins and was ablaze and was cleared of resistance. And here you see what it looked like at one stage around that. You can see the Lancia armored cars of the Provisional Army in front of it. See the shell damage here, but it got even worse. <clears throat> Some of the buildings went on fire afterwards and uh, even more in ruins. But by the, the evening of the 5th of July, only Colbrew remained of the anti-treaty forces. He had sent his companions out uh, to, uh, to, to, to escape. But he emerged from the back of the Granville Hotel with his revolver in hand, refusing to surrender. And he was cut down uh, by a Lewis gun burst and he was mortally wounded, hit in the femoral artery, and he died a few days later. So the Republicans fled the city, and the main conflict of the, of the Civil War now moved to the countryside. So the pro-treaty army now moved out and advanced on several fronts. And Waterford was one of the early uh, places captured by them. On the 19th of July, Commandant General Proud's Pro Treaty Forces set up uh, on an escarpment north of the city, which is occupied by Republican forces. And the, they had one 18 pounder and they proceeded to pound the, the uh, strongholds across the river. They, then the troops rode across the river and seized the key, the main, the main part of, uh, of Waterford. And they when they reached the Granville Hotel, the other Granville Hotel, not the one in Dublin, they discovered a mine and they disarmed it. And here's another great colorized photograph. These are the troops 
in front of the Granville Hotel in Waterford, proudly showing the mine that they'd that they'd disarmed. Across, still in Munster, but uh, uh, to the west, Limerick on the Shannon was a very key strategic point between Munster and Connacht. At the end, end of July, there was a, a rerun of the Dublin city fighting. The Provisional Government Army took the, the city from the anti-treaty IRA, um, again using artillery, and ejected them from the very many barracks that are, there are in, in Limerick City. The fighting then, again, moved on to the countryside, uh, again in the Brewery and Kilmanach Kilmel region. And here's another great photograph. It's from the fighting in the countryside around Limerick, and it shows a pro-treaty convoy passing through a village. These are pro-treaty troops, but they're in civvies, if you like, and um, a local supporter offers them the fighting men, a few cigarettes. With much of Munster and, and the West still under Republican control, the generals of the government army decided in July 1922 to mount a series of amphibious landings on the southern and western coast. The, both the roads and the railways were impassable down to Munster and the West. So cross-channel steamers were commandeered and loaded with troops armoured cars and artillery, and the, the biggest operation targeted Cork. And they planned a landing in Cork Harbour with simultaneous landings at Yall and Union Hall in West Cork. And so on the 7th of August, a flotilla of steamers sailed from, sailed from Dublin's North Wall. And here is a photograph on the left. You see a scene on the deck of the steamer, the Arvonia. You see the 18-pounder. And you see what's scrawled on it. It's a veteran of the shelling of the forecourts. And on the right is another steamer, the Lady Wicklow, full of troops, a slightly later seen uh, further up in Cork Harbour, but again, full of troops. So uh, the Arvonia was unable to, to proceed upriver at that stage for fear of mines in Cork Harbour. And they docked at the Queenstown dry docks and passage west. And here we see them setting off from there. The Republican forces rushed to the area to resist the incursion. And there was heavy fighting over the following days in the rolling hills between passage west and Rochestown and they further on into Cork City. After this fierce fighting, Cork City was taken on the evening of the 10th of August and the Republican forces withdrew and headed to McCroom and regrouped there. And from then on, the Republicans dispersed and the war in the Southwest now entered a guerrilla, guerrilla phase. And with the taking of, the Cork, of Cork, the core of what had been called the so-called Munster Republic faded away. Action continued all over the country, of course, uh, and there was huge destruction on the railways. And as I said, as the struggle moved into a guerrilla phase, the railways, which were a soft target, were sabotaged at will by the anti-treaty IRA. Bridges were blown and locomotives derailed. And this is a very dramatic shot at Bally William, January 1923, showing a derailed locomotive. As the uh, repair gang wait to, to sort it out. But danger still lurked all across the countryside. Michael Collins made a tour of his native West Cork in August 1922. And as he travelled in his convoy, he was shot dead in an ambush at Bilnablaw on the evening of 22nd of August. And again, a dramatic continental depiction, fairly inaccurate, but you get the picture there. Um, there was universal sorrow at his death, and on the 28th of August, his funeral corsage passed through enormous uh, crowds in Dublin to, to his, his burial in Glasnevin Cemetery. And as the months rolled on with the cities under control, government forces 
were capturing towns and then they mounted sweeps in the countryside. But the anti-treaty fighters still still roamed the remoter areas, particularly those of Kerry, Cork, Mayo and Sligo. And in September 1922, the National Army troops made a big sweep around Sligo and in one chase, they followed an IRA unit up Ben Bulban Mountain. And on the morning of the 20th of September, they captured four of them and they just didn't hesitate. They just shot them dead on the mountain here. You see Ben Bulban, the t top of it. This is up a gully. You see the, the cross marking where the four men were, were, were killed. Um, these included Seamus Devins, a TD, and Brian, Brian McNeil, who's son of Owen McNeil. Um, uh, Brian McNeil, I guess, was is uncle of uh, Michael McDool, as it happens. Two others were shot elsewhere on the mountain, and the sl slain Republicans are still known around Sligo, as you see them here, as the Sligo Noble Six. And towards the end of 1922, the war moved into an even more bitter phase. A public safety bill was passed. It included a provision for the death penalty for anybody found carrying a weapon. The veteran Republican author, Erskine Childers, captured with an auto, a small automatic given him as a gift by Michael Collins, as it happened in early November 1922. He was uh, brought to trial, sentenced to death, and he was shot at Beggar's Bush Barracks, and he met his de death bravely and with dignity. As it happens, the provisional government became the Free State Government on the 6th of December 1922, one year after the treaty. And the conflict got worse. A government TD was assassinated in Dublin on the 7th of December 1922. This frightened and alarmed the provisional government its executive <clears throat> council met at an emergency session, uh, an immediate emergency session, and they ordered that four prominent Republicans who were held in Mountjoy prison be executed. This really was an extra judicial killing. It was murder, really, it, and they they affirmed it was a reprisal. And the four, four were awakened from their sleep and told that they were going to be shot at 7 a.m. 7 a few hours afterwards. And they were all shot together at 7 o'clock the, on the morning of the 8th of December. But the Civil War was even going to be get even worse. It was no longer an honourable war between former colleagues. The Nader came in early 1923 in Kerry. It started when a trap mine, which was a deception really, they were lured to where they thought was a stash of explosives. And it was a trap mine and it exploded and killed five anti-treaty soldiers here. Uh, you see it here. Sorry, that's the memorial of the four executed in Mountjoy. Here we come on the left, you see the very unlovely looking boreen, which in the trees to the right was this, this supposed um, store of a Republican uh, explosive. Anyway, five soldiers were killed here and it included two captains former of the Dublin Guard who were comrades of the officer in charge in Tralee and in charge of the Kerry Command, Brigadier General Paddy Daly. Now, he was incandescent on hearing the news about his comrades being blown up. So on the night of the 7th of March, uh, 1923, the day after the trap mine explosion, nine prisoners were brought from the barrack centrally and placed at a barrack at Ballycedy, just outside the town. They were tied together and blown up by a mine. Uh, there was only one survivor, but as news of the massacre filtered out, there were efforts to cover it up. And on the right-hand side here, you can see the very tortured and evocative memorial at Ballyseedy. And over the following days in Kerry, a total of nine other prisoners were also murdered by the government soldiers at Carsavine and Killarney, either by machine gun or by mines. It was very cruel, brutal and brutal. <clears throat> 
By the spring of 1923, the anti-treaty struggle was ebbing away. And the chief of staff of the IRA, Liam Lynch, was on his way to, on a meeting, to a meeting to discuss stopping the war. And this is uh, Liam Lynch on the left. But there were, it just so happened there was a sweep by the Free State forces uh, on the Knockmill Downs. And uh, Lynch was shot by a bullet uh, from far away uh, on a mountain in County Tipperary. And this is the Round Tower, which is the uh, on the spot where he was, where he was uh, shot on the Knockmill Downs. And he died uh, that evening. <clears throat> So the conflict came to an inconclusive end when the new chief of staff of the IRA, Frank Aitken, issued a ceasefire order on the 24th of May, 1923. And so the Irish Revolution had juddered to an end. The 26 counties free state, a kind of a dominion, continued. And however, it was an impoverished state and there was a lot of reconstruction to do. At the end of 1925, the Free State, on foot of financial concessions from the British, some might say bribery, agreed to terminate the commission that I had mentioned that had been set up to study the allocation of the border territories, the Boundary Commission. And so that was the end of any discussion of partition. The Republic was established in 1948, and our island is still partitioned, but that's another story. And so around 100 years on, we can look back at the Irish Revolution. Commencing in 2012, the government organized the Decades of Centenaries program. It focused on the significant centenaries of the events le leading up to 1923. And the objective was to ensure that this complex period of Ireland's history was remembered proportionally, respectfully, and with sensitivity. And in my opinion, I think they've it's generally been successful. And I give one example. This photograph shows soldiers of the Irish Defence Forces lining up during the commemoration ceremony in 2016 at Arbor Hill, where the executed leaders of the Easter Rising are buried. And just to add, I chose this photograph because the officer at the front there is one Captain Michael D. Barry. <laughs> and um, as I finish, I want to thank that I appreciate your kind attention. And it, as always, it is an honor to be invited by the very learned uh, Hellenic Society. And thanks to Theo for his technical help. And again, I'm very grateful to Paddy Salmon for his organization. And also to add that Paddy has been a great and consistent help to me in all my books. So thanks again to all of you. Well, Michael. Once again, that has been an absolutely amazing tour de force. And I hope you all realize that there, there is practically nobody else on earth who could have done what we have just witnessed over the last, the guts of an hour. Um, there are just one or two uh, comments or questions, and I, I hesitate to, uh, to, to, to ask Michael <laughs> to, to go on any longer. Only, because... <laughs> only easy questions. But <laughs> well, here's a very easy question from yeah. Stelios Varipatis. Yes. And he says, is there any relation between the author and Kevin Barry, no. the Irish Republican? So, no, that, 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 that's an Neither, odd heat. Nor, nor, nor Tom Barry either. Nor of Tom Barry. No. There, there, there are lots of Barrys in the country. <laughs> but it was a good try. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. have to admit that. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, May Ryan uh, which gives a comment which I think will resonate with a lot of people. She says, when I left school in 1967, we had learned no history beyond 1916. And I would certainly uh, second that because really what's in your book, Michael, is, is a fantastic um, a revelation to many of us because I too you know was at school in the 60s and early 70s and and you know the amount of what what we were learning was very very abstract indeed whereas what you 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 have you have produced it brings it brings it very much it puts it puts flesh and I'm afraid a lot of blood on 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 uh, much much of what was going on you know but uh, to my to my amazement from 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 reading uh, this book this huge book uh, particularly which is about I think is it 850 photographs in it Michael something yeah something like 
like that. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, all all captioned and and with a with a text as well. So wh- what I discovered was that you know when I was growing up in Drumcondra, a lot of the places around where where I used to play were were littered with with references to to what was going on in in the in the years that you've been just been discussing, you know, um, literally out in in the street outside uh, Saint Pat's in Drumcondra there had been action and further up uh, uh up, up up the um drum road up, uh, up, up towards um Griffith Avenue direction, Home Farm Road, there had been another spectacular event where Dan Breen and Sean Tracy were involved. Uh, and in fact, uh, just to, to, to reassure those who are watching that what you would get in this book is actually extremely accurate because you will read a lot of rubbish online. I, I even read in one website, Michael, that Dan Breen had, had, a, he had been injured in that attack and succumbed to his injuries in the hospital a few <laughs> days later. Whereas <laughs> I distinctly remember Dan Breen in the doll in the 1960s. Yeah. So that no, must have he, been, he was he doing made- his Lazarus act. I think you know. Yeah, he made it to the matter where the nuns <laughs> looked after him very well. And I think he married one, not one of the nuns, but one of the sisters. Did he? Did he? He did. Uh, I think yes. Yes, he yes. Did. Yeah, there's a there's a photograph. I I think it's in the book actually, uh, showing Dan Breen uh, getting married. Uh, sitting with his bride and Sean Hogan and volunteers uniform behind him, and uh, I think it was just before the truce. But of course. Uh, he has his Parabellum revolver sitting on his lap, uh, a revolver in one hand and a bride in the other. Um, <laughs> we won't go down that road, please, please, please. The other thing I would say to, to um, there is one other comment actually from Stella Xanopoulos. She just says an excellent book. And especially she has a daughter who's doing junior cert. So for somebody, you know, this is a book of photographs. You know, it's a huge, it's, it's a delight to the eye. And I also recommend you, to get one of these things because you can look. I was looking at the screen as you were talking there, Michael, but also on the book, the detail, the fineness of the printing. This this book is printed on superb paper. The book weighs a ton because it's on such good paper. But you can actually look at these pictures as if you were looking at the originals and they will they will come before you. You can actually practically see the number on Michael Collins's bicycle. It's that detail. It's just quite amazing. Yeah, um, what I would say for, for the Greek people watching is uh, when you look around, this, 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 was, this was a, you know, particularly in 1916, the War of Independence, uh, these were things happening in a capital city. Uh, very a very rare thing in in you know recent centuries in, in Europe maybe apart from Berlin, uh, but um, when you when you come out from this the, the door the, the the steps of the Greek Embassy in Pembroke Street in Dublin near Fitzwilliam Square and look across there's an archway and the house on the right of that was one yes. of the major scenes uh, on the morning of of Sunday the twenty first of November uh, nineteen twenty bloody Sunday so there were, there were a lot of casualties in the in that house um, right literally right across from from you know where the ambassador is looking out across the street that that is the house that that you're actually looking at you know uh, but also you know in in, in among the pictures in the book, you've got a, a picture of a little archway leading into the stag's head <laughs> pub, <laughs> which I frequented as a student <laughs> in Trinity and went down that alleyway any number of times without knowing its its significance, you know. Um, and it, it's just, it's it's very, um, for, for a Dubliner, it's very affecting uh, to, to, to have the story brought alive because for so long, as with many conflicts, people did not want to speak about this conflict. It was something, a, you know, there was, a, there was a fog was drawn over it. And it's only thanks to you, Michael, I know you have laboured long in the military archives and in the, in, in the National Library and in the yeah, New York Public Library looking for these wonderful coloured illustrations. And we're, we're extremely indebted to you. Um, let me just say finally, Michael, that, that this has been a very, very difficult year. And you have enlightened us at the end of a year 2020, which all of us, I think, will uh, very soon be very glad to forget about. Um, <laughs> but we will not forget uh, your contribution to us um, uh, 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 on tonight, on the 9th of December. At this time of the year, normally the Irish Hellenic Society is uh, rejoicing after a wonderful lunch uh, in the uh, Royal St. George Yacht Club. And um, we, we regret that this was not possible uh, this year, but we, we look forward to uh, celebrating in better times uh, Tuchronu next year, not in Jerusalem, but in the Royal St. George. <laughs> um, but I would also like just to say that um, please uh, don't forget at this time of the year Alice Leahy's trust. Alice Leahy was our guest of honour in in uh, in in Dunleary in the Art Club last year, and her charity looks after homeless people in Dublin. 
And uh, certainly if you were out and about uh, on Sunday in the fog here, the cold was bitter. So please remember Alice Leahy's trust. Um, if you're, if you're uh, interested in giving something to a very deserving charity um, over, over the coming weeks. Um, Michael, thank you very much once again. And may your next book be even better than this huge, this is a magnum opus. This will not only enlighten you folks, but it will give you biceps. It's so heavy. <laughs> and on that note, I'd like to say good night. And if you saw, para para poli, apo all, all us mas. Thank you all too. All, all the best. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks, Paddy. Good night now. Good night to you all. Yeah. And happy Christmas to you all. Kales yortes.